you um, so much um, to Endometriosis UK for inviting me to speak about some of the research um, opportunities in NHS Lothian, which is where I work. I work for the University of Edinburgh. Um, and as Emma has mentioned, I'm going to be talking about my role, a little bit about research, what it may look like. And then I've got four in-depth um, different trials to look at as well and where we are recruiting at the moment or where we may be recruiting very in the near future. Just to let you know, um, for the purposes of a presentation, there is a couple of um, times where the word woman has been mentioned, and that is referring to anyone assigned female at birth. Um, and um, well, thank you so much, Emma, for putting up with me and for asking me to come along today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what the journey of anyone with endometriosis may look like. We would love it for us to, um, for any patient to have their first symptoms and for it to be a straight line where we are managing uh, to get a diagnosis and a treatment plan, which is tailored and pain management, symptom management. But unfortunately for uh, those who have joined us who um, are sadly suffering from endometriosis or they're currently trying to seek an, a diagnosis, um, their journey may look a little bit more like this. So from first symptoms to the visit to the GP, some online research visit to specialists, we may not get a diagnosis um, and, you know, may try, try to different medical treatments and then at the very end, hopefully we would get a, a management plan. My I'll present that you're on me. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, you So sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, so my <coughs> role as a researcher, we would love to be somewhere there. Ideally, we would love to be there at the very beginning um, of anyone's journey because we are very keen to embed and um, integrate research into clinical care. I think it should be an option for anyone um, to who, who may fulfill that criteria. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about more. Oh, sugar, I was trying to do this instead. But, so um, sometimes it may feel a little bit like this. So here's the research staff and then the potential participant and crossing the chasm can actually feel um, quite tricky um, because you may have never encountered research staff when you have attended clinic. And that may be for a, a various reasons, um, just because the current research opportunities um, are not um, a, available to you in that clinic um, because you know we're not currently recruiting, for example, patients with deep endometriosis or the other way around as well, where um, patients have got pelvic pain um, and um, or don't have a diagnosis of endometriosis. So sometimes it feels a little bit like that. Our, our aim is to, like I say, embed research. Um, so you may think um, that our job is to um, gather large volumes of patients who are willing to take part in our research and for us to get them to sign on the dotted line. But in actual fact, it's more like this. And what we try to do um, is to actually um, tell you all about the research available to you um, when you do come to see us, or you may hear from us um, via a letter of invitation, perhaps. It could be that one of your gynecologists um, has um, nominated, you know, has actually um, looked at your clinical presentation said actually this may be of benefit to the patient or it could be that um, you know you, you have um, expressed an interest in taking part in research so um, our role is actually to tell you about the research opportunities available to you and you know we are nurses and midwives at the end of the day we want you to um, you know you come first your clinical come, uh, care comes first. And it could be that we tell you about this research opportunity, we start talking to you and it becomes apparent very quickly that this may not be in your best interest. And you know, a lot of the um, 
research trials have got a very strict criteria. So it could be that a simple thing that we ask you may, um, you know, um, say, actually, you're not able to take part in this trial. I always say, don't worry, something will come along at some point in your journey um, as an endometriosis sufferer. So um, that's what I always re reassure, you know. Um, and when I was talking about the consultation, like I say, it could be that you see us after clinic because you've come, you've spoken to your gynecologist and, you, and they've said, actually, there's this trial, would you like to hear more? And then that's where I come in or my team here in Edinburgh where, you know, we might give you a call later if it's not suitable for you to speak at the time, because obviously you may have just said, I'm going to the gynecologist and um, it's going to be a 20 minute appointment. And then obviously you've got other commitments. So talking to me may not be the best thing to do at that time, uh, but we can always schedule a, a call and work around you. We try to be as flexible as possible, I promise you. Um, so just to go over some research terms, um, and please forgive me if you already know this, but um, I just thought for the benefit of any viewer who, any viewers who have not ever taken part in research, so um, multi-centre, for example, um, it's just basically what, me, what it, you know, what it's, the, it says on the tin. So multi-centre just refers to any study that's recruiting at more than one hospital. Um, so it could be two hospitals or it could be 70 hospitals UK wide. It just very much depends. There are some trials that recruit worldwide, which, you know, are very um, large and they've got thousands of, of um hospitals open or it could be something simple like it's actually a just single centre sort of trial. Um, just to say as well please if you um, if you know that at your hospital they're not recruiting for that specific study it doesn't mean you know that you're not getting the best care it just means that that hospital is not currently recruiting at that time um, the study there's lots and lots of different factors as to why that might be it could be as simple as they don't have capacity to do certain things so therefore they're not able to take part but they're very interested in the study um, we do know however that um, hospitals who are research active um, uh, have better patient outcomes and patients submitted to more research active hospitals have more confidence um, according to some research that um, and are better informed about the condition and that's what they said to them. Um, that's according to research because obviously that's all we're talking about today so that's perfect. Um, with regards to randomization um, it's basically a process by which we assign uh, patients per chance to different groups so um, this is usually done by a computer and it's so that it removes the human bias that could be unconsciously, you know, I could be putting you in a group that actually may benefit you because we've had a chat. So by randomizing, pressing a button on a computer, it just removes all that and it just randomly allocates you to either perhaps other, either treatment arm. So for example, maybe it was like a placebo or it was actually the, the active drug. So um, that's what the randomization means. And finally, the blinding, which is um, when the patient doesn't know which treatment uh, they have been given. Now, you may have heard the term double blind, and that means that neither you as a patient or um, your research staff know what treatment you are allocated to. So um, that way we don't treat you differently if you were perhaps not taking the, the active drug, for example. Um, and basically by having a randomized controlled blind trial, it actually is the gold standard of trials because it allows us to compare. It's the best way of comparing um, you know, treatment options for you in the future. So I've taken some reasons for taking part from various um, websites um, pertaining to, to research. And I feel the first one is so, so true. Um, me and the research team uh, that, you know, who, who work tirelessly at um, EXPECT, um, women usually, you know, um, patients usually want to help others, including the family members who may potentially develop the same condition. Um, especially with endometriosis, where it could be a genetic link, familial. You know, if your mum had endometriosis, you, you 
more likely to perhaps have endometriosis. Um, and by this stage, you have probably got a diagnosis. You, you know, I always think we're, um, patients with endometriosis are so, so um, altruistic because they help us with many things, like sample collections, um, which do not benefit the patient at all. So it's not all about benefiting the patients, it's about learning more about the condition like endometriosis. Um, we want to add to the body of information available for patients. Um, again, we need to find out as much as we can for endometriosis. We want to find a cure. It would be amazing. Um, but we also, in the meantime, need to find better treatment options um, for those with the condition. Um, the other con um, reason would be to receive a new treatment that's not yet available to treat endometriosis. And I'm going to talk about um, EPIC, which is dichloracetate. And that's a little bit later on. I'm just going to tell you a little bit how we've repurposed a supplement, which is not normally used for um, the treatment of endometriosis. Um, the other reason is to receive additional care and support from the clinical staff and to be honest, research staff, sorry. And to be honest with you, we get a lot of feedback from patients saying they really appreciate that extra layer of support. We cannot give clinical um, advice, so just to let you know, um, but we can direct you in the right place. And if I know anything about research um, nurses and midwives is that they are like a dog, you know, dog, dog with a bone and they will try and help you and find the best um Best thing for you, really. Um, so if we don't know the answer, we will find for you and direct you to where to go. And then finally, to help advance medical knowledge, which is um, ideal, what we want to do and just understand the condition more. So there's three different types of research. And one of them is medical, which is obviously the medication versus placebo, so like a dummy pill, like a sugar pill, or a different type of medication. So it could be that we're trying a medication like, um, for example, gabapentin, which is a neuromodulator, but we're actually going to compare that to duloxetine, which is an antidepressant, but also helps with nerve pain. Which one works better, you know? Um, or it could be that we're doing the gabapentin versus placebo. The other type of research is surgical. So this could be looking at different surgical techniques. Um, and I'm going to come to that a little bit more in the Esprit 2 trial, um, which we're hoping to um, may give us a little bit more of an answer with regards to the um, ablation versus excision um, technique. And then also for surgical trials, we always ask patients who are going for surgery if they would like to um, allow us to collect some samples during surgery. And again, that is not helping um, the patient, it's helping advance, you know, um, medical research in that field. So we, we always ask for questionnaires to um, capture all the information with regards to your symptoms. And then we correlate that what we find in surgery. So that's extremely useful. And again, when uh, we come to the EPIC trial, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got there. And this all came from the collections that we did here in Edinburgh. There's also the observational type, which is asking for a questionnaire to be completed or surveys that you may, you know, Endometriosis UK is great at advertising research. Uh, and it could be that it's a survey that you've completed. We also at Edinburgh, we're doing this Indotech study at the moment, and it's wearable technology. So it's a it's a smart watch, as we call it. Unfortunately, it doesn't do very much. It doesn't tell you the time or anything like that. But we are asking ladies to to wear that for um, a period of time. And then we put that together with the symptoms, which is quite exciting because it's not non invasive as well. And then there's the data linkage, which is um, combining um, other um, I've written it here, so I combine data from different sources so that perhaps it's relating to you, the same person, but uh, we may in the future, with your permission, if you've taken part in a specific trial, say, can we look at your notes in two to five years to see if we can um, correlate whether, you know, there's been any fertility issues, et cetera, what your symptom control is. So I've put here this sort of sample research journey of what it may look like. Um, now, with COVID, things have improved in the sense of we are asking patients to come to the hospital less, which is great because obviously we're not 
exposing any patients to, to COVID-19 unnecessarily. Um, the consent process was usually always done in person, um, but it's now been allowed for certain trials to be done over the phone, which is really useful. Now, obviously, you know, before you get to this, where you're taking part in this trial, we would speak to you and say, there's this opportunity for research. Here's a patient information sheet. That's what it's called. We call it a PIS for short. And it gives you the good, the bad and the ugly of taking part in that specific trial. Um, and it could be that it says it's no benefit to you or we hope there is some benefit to you. Um, and with any research, you can always withdraw at any time without your medical or um, care or your rights being affected. Obviously, we're very grateful. We would just ask you, um, is there any um, chance that we could possibly keep the data up to now? It could be that you say, no, I don't want any data used up to now. And you, I need you to destroy that. And that's absolutely fine. Um, but of course, you know, you're, you're the one helping us. So we um, really appreciate your help. Um, so it could be that you come in for the consent or telephone. It could be that you're in for a clinical appointment. So we we quite flexible. We say to you, actually, I'll see you after your medical, your clinical appointment. That'll be easy. Get to meet each other. It could be that sometimes we do video calls as well. So that's nice to put a face um, to, to someone who you're talking to. It could be that then, um, say for example, you do pain scores for four weeks. We do some questionnaires. We start you on a medication, see how you are. We always have doctors um, available to us if we've got any questions, especially when it's pertaining to uh, a drug. Um, we always have to have oversight from the doctors who are well-versed in the study. So um, they, they have done extra training to help us with that. Um, it could be that we do questionnaires halfway, pain scores will last four weeks, and then we reduce the dose. And then we say to you, what do you think you were taking? Do you think you were taking placebo? You, do you think you were taking the, the actual drug? That removes all bias and then tells us why you thought that. And it gives us a really good answer. And then all this que these questionnaires are just invaluable and so vital. So I haven't spoken about all of that. And these are the trials we will be discussing today. So the first one is SP2 trial, and that is pertaining to superficial peritoneal endometriosis. Then we've got the Diamond trial, which is deep infiltrating endometriosis. Regal trial, which is um, including all subtypes of endometriosis. And then EPIC, which at the moment we're looking at superficial peritoneal endometriosis. So there's a bit of mixture. So like I say, a bit of everything for, you know, or it could be that you're looking at that saying, actually, I cannot take part in SP2, but I could maybe consider uh, the Regal trial. So let's go on to SP2 and what it is. So um, the aim of the trial is um, to determine whether removal, removing superficial peritoneal endometriosis improves pa painful symptoms and quality of life. Now, as you will probably know, um, there are four stages of endometriosis, but then there's three different types, which is a superficial peritoneal endometriosis, then there's the endometrioma of an, or ovarian endometriosis, and then there's the deep infiltrating endometriosis. So we are interested in the superficial type for this study. We want to find out which surgical may, um, approach may be best. So we're collecting information about ablation versus excision, which I think it's quite a debated subject in the endometriosis world. Um, we want to find out how often surgery is of no benefit and could it possibly wor be worsening symptoms? So um, I'm going to go into the inclusion criteria um, later on as to um, what, what type of patients we're looking for. But the other thing um, that we are uh, uh, recruiting to the study for and asking patients to be very kind to us and say, I will give you a blood sample, is this ISPRI plus and also the scanning sub-study. So we want to try and improve how we diagnose endometriosis. Um, and basically we're asking ladies who are saying yes to this pre 2 trial. So you have to have said yes to this and you have to have um, been deemed um, appropriate to take part. We would like to see whether the blood test um, can tell us whether you know, a person has endometriosis. So we're asking patients to give us a blood test before the surgery and then six months um, 
after the surgery if indeed they have endometriosis. So that's going to give us so many, a um, huge number of, of participants that gives us blood tests. And I mean, it would be life changing. And if we could find a blood test to diagnose endometriosis, I just think it would be fantastic. And then if it wasn't fantastic enough, we also have the sub study um, where we're using ultrasound scan to see if we can diagnose endometriosis, superficial endometriosis. This is in two London hospitals at the moment, which is UCLH and uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's. Um, so as you can see, we're trying to tackle um, diagnosis from all angles and to, to see, can we actually improve the way we diagnose endometriosis? Um, so if you did take part, and this is for, lady, uh, for patients who don't have a diagnosis of endometriosis as yet. So it could be that you're going for your first diagnostic laparoscopy. It could be that you've had a laparoscopy in the past, which doesn't show endometriosis, but they feel that perhaps your symptoms, again, you know, they're going to do another diagnostic laparoscopy. Um, and then what would happen is if you took part, you would complete some questionnaires. You would then um, give us a blood sample if you would like to. You don't have to, but we always ask you to give us a blood sample if possible. You would then have your surgery and you would be randomised whilst you're in theatre um, having your operation. And what would happen then is the computer would decide, yes, they are going to remove the endometriosis or no, we're going to leave the endometriosis. We're going to do a really good survey of, of your pelvis. We're going to have a really good look. We're going to look at the number of lesions, what they look like um, and where the location as well. And after surgery, we will tell you that you do have endometriosis if indeed you do. Um, th this is for the superficial kind. Um, we can tell you the location and number of lesions, the severity of the endo uh, found. And However, we don't tell you whether it's been removed or not. And then what will happen is um, at intervals, at three, six and 12 month um, intervals, we will ask you to complete questionnaires um, telling us a little bit about your, your symptoms and how you are. You will be able to access all the medical treatments for endometriosis um, during the 12 months of participation. And then after the 12 months are up, we will ask you which arm of the study you think you were and why. And we will um, then say, we will unblind you, which is the other term that we use, and we will then tell them whether their endometriosis has been removed or not. We're also looking at um, inter reintervention rates at two and five years to see have you um, do you then go on to have a further surgery or do you have uh, further visits with a gynecologist? We also ask you if it's okay to look at fertility outcomes. Um, you know, have you tried? Uh, for a pregnancy or have you had any issues with fertility? And then we also uh, like to look at symptom control. Have you tried other medications, etc.? But of course, we ask you for permission um, on the consent form for this. So inclusion, you have to be aged over 16 and you have to be undergoing laparoscopy for the investigation of chronic pelvic pain. And like I say, you cannot have had a diagnosis, a diagnosis of endometriosis already. Um, so in order to be randomised um, in theatre, we need to find superficial perennial disease at time of laparoscopy. And if we do find anything else other, for example, we find deep disease, you don't progress to the next stage of the trial. But all the data that we've collected, um, you know, you may have given us a blood test and then we collect the information um, that your surgeon has completed about, you know, the location of, um, and we put that of, of endometriosis, and then we put that together with symptoms. It really helps us. It's vital for us to understand it better. If we find, for example, something like a cyst and we think that's what's causing your pain, we do not randomize you. You always come first in the clinical care, sort of. Um, that always comes first. Um, so if the surgeon deems that actually that could be causing your pain, we, we don't randomize you into the trial. So just to say, um, this is what the journey looks like. So there would be an initial visit or telephone call. And it could be that you've received an invitation letter from us because your, your, your gynecologist has said, actually, um, this lady um, may be eligible to take part. It may be of her, you know, of interest. 
um, we would complete the consent and com confirm eligibility. We do baseline questionnaires um, and the Esprit Plus blood sample. We then perform the surgery, not me, someone much more clever and skilled and, and than me does the surgery, and then we randomize. So you'd either go to the diagnostic lab or you go to the diagnostic laparoscopy plus the removal of endometriosis. We complete a diary for seven days. We ask you to complete that for us just so that we look at pain relief, et cetera. We then give you a call at 30 days to see how things are doing. And we then complete questionnaires at three months, six months and uh, 12 months. And that's when we unblind you. We repeat the blood test for those uh, participants who have been randomized into the trial six months and I think that's to look at inflammation etc to see if that we can see a difference. So just to tell you a little bit about the progress so it's quite a large trial we anticipate requiring 1200 participants um, because we need to randomize 400. Now that number may change um, and the reason for that is because a lot of the time when a patient goes to theatre, it could be that we find no endometriosis, it could be that we find other findings, for example, uh, scar tissue or cysts, etc. So those patients are not able, uh, we're not able to randomise and take further into the, the trial. So that's why we anticipate that we'll need about 1200 so that we probably will randomise about 400 in, in total. That's a huge number and it's going to give us so much information. And do you know what I love about this trial is the fact that it's going to give us an answer. Is removing a superficial disease actually doing good or is it doing more harm? Or it could be that it does really um, benefit patients in a certain group or maybe not. So this trial is going to give us an answer either way. Um, so that's what I like about it. And we are currently um, at... 217 participants and we have randomized 42. Now that looks really we compared to obviously the 217 but obviously COVID uh, we've taken quite a big hit and patients have been waiting longer and longer for the surgery which is just awful uh, but we are trying to get um, improve on those numbers and I had a really positive um, chat with clinical staff earlier this week that they're trying to bring that um, weight down quite substantially. And we're recruiting at 37 hospitals UK wide. And just to say, I've um, put the locations there. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the names of the hospitals. It's the hospital trusts that I have the name for. Um, and this is where we're recruiting. Um, Fab, I will go on to speak about Diamond. And this is a trial where we're looking to see um, whether for deep disease, is it best to have surgery and have the removal? Or in actual fact, is it best to have medical management? So all the medical treatments, does that help with the pain, etc.? So just a bit of background um, that BSG centres have a central database where patients with deep endometriosis are entered into. The management and surgery details are collected and their symptoms are recorded at baseline and at six months after surgery. We know from this data that most patients do benefit from surgery if they have deep disease. However, we do not have a direct compa comparison with medical management and we also don't have data for 18, you know, 12, 18, 24 months after. So this would be com um, actually um, um, collecting all that information. We're looking for um, women aged 18 to 49 who are seeking treatment for pain. Laparoscopically, they have been confirmed to have deep endometriosis, or it could be that this has been diagnosed, for example, on an MRI scan. Um, we want them to be suitable for either surgical or medical management. This is obviously um, double checked with uh, the research staff and the clinical staff who are helping the research staff to make sure that the patients are eligible. Not planning to conceive in the next 18 months and not, have not undergone previous surgery for deep endometriosis. So 
You can have had obviously your, your diagnostic laparoscopy, but you're waiting for the repeat diagnosis uh, treat, uh, treatment sort of thing, the removal. So this is what it looks like of um, a little bit about the journey. So you would have an initial visit um, that would be the consent eligibility confirmed by a doctor and the randomization would happen there and then. And you would be randomized to either laparoscopic surgery and removal of endometriosis or in actual fact, hormonal medical treatment and neuromodulators and analgesics if need, need be. We would then ask you to complete questionnaires at 12 weeks then at 12 months and then at 18 months again and see how you're feeling. We are looking for 400 participants and currently we are recruiting an NHS Grampian, which are, uh, for those not familiar with Scotland, that's in Aberdeen. And we're gonna be opening very, very soon in Edinburgh and that's NHS Lothian. Um, one of the things um, to, sorry, actually I was gonna mention that about Regal, so I'll go on to Regal now. So that's who we are looking for for a diamond and why we're doing that. And then the Regal trial um, is encompassing all the subtypes of endometriosis. And it's for patients who have recurrent pain uh, despite having had surgical management. So in the Regal study, we want to find out whether using GnRH analogs. So that is the, for example, Things like Solodex or Decapeptal, which is the injection, it may, um, you may recognize it as, you know, it's almost like a chemical sort of menopause uh, to try and shut down your ovaries for, for a given period of time. And we add in HRT and we're find, trying to find out, can it improve the quality of life for women by controlling pain when compared to repeat laparoscopic surgery to treat endometriosis? We also want to find out which treatment makes best use of NHS resources. Now, what's really good about Regal is the fact that um, you are randomized there and then, and then we ask you, you know, um, I, think, I think if you wanted to take part in Regal, you would need to be comfortable with the fact that you were either gonna have surgery or in actual fact, you are going to have um, the GnRH analogs. Um, the good thing about Regal is the fact that GnRH analogs are usually prescribed in clinical work um, between six and 12 months as a maximum. But in actual fact, uh, for the purposes of Regal, we're going to allow patients to have the GnRH uh, analogs for up to um, um, two years, so 24 months. They add in safety measures by um, having uh, three bone scans because that can sometimes affect your bone density, the, the decapeptal and solidex. So we do a scan at the very beginning, another scan at 12 months, and then another scan at 24. So that again, that's all looked at um, by clinical staff well versed in the, in the trial. So we're hoping to recruit 400 participants to the study, two, uh, 200 in each arm, and we are currently at 52 participants across nine hospitals. So we're looking for um, patients who are female and aged between 21 and 49. You have recurrent pain following laparoscopic treatment for endometriosis. You wish to avoid the removal of your ovaries and a hysterectomy. Now, one of the things to remember is you may not know this, but if you have surgery and you would, you, you're trying to preserve your ovaries, um, Sadly, there is, you are at six times more likely to require an intervention. And by that, we mean, um, you know, you may need further surgery, or it could be that you need to um, see the gynecologist more often, you've seen your GP more often. So um, it, Regal may be a good um, option for you if you are wishing to avoid the removal of your ovaries. Um, your doctor considers you suitable for both arms, obviously, and then you're not planning planning to conceive in the next two years. This is what the journey looks like. So again, the initial visit, and then we do the randomization on the day. And then you find out whether you're gonna be on the GnRH um, analog uh, treatment arm or the surgery. And we're asking patients who are going for surgery to also provide us with a baseline bone scan so that we can have that as a direct comparison with the arm, um, you know, the other patients that are in the other arm as well to help us with that. 
So a lot of information being gathered, which is fantastic. And these are the locations in which we are um, recruiting. As you can see, it's quite spread out in the country. And finally, we're coming to EPIC trial. Um, this is very exciting for me, um, and I think for the endometriosis community as well. So um, remember earlier on when I was talking about the surgical type of research. So in NHS Lothian, we collect samples at surgery to help us understand the disease further. Um, what happened was um, we collect what's known as peritoneal fluids. So if you can imagine your pelvis, there is this physiological fluid that sets there. It doesn't really do very much, but it's got a lot of information. And we found that actually patients with endometriosis have got higher levels of lactic acid in the peritoneal fluid that we found. Now, I just think about it in, for example, if you get a cramp in your leg, that's higher levels of lactic acid. Now you can usually shake that off because you can move your leg, but you know, if it's sitting in your pelvis, you can't really move your pelvis very, very well. Um, they, you know, we're thinking, is that irritating your organs? Is that making things worse? So someone very clever knew that dichloracetate, I'm gonna call it DCA for short because um, it's too long to remember. It actually reduces levels of lactate. And basically we decided to have a trial and this focused on the safety and acceptability of the supplement rather on how well it worked sort of thing. But just to let you know, I recruited to this study and I um, managed to um, recruit 30 ladies um, who were wonderful um, and what I could say is some patients did have a profound effect and others didn't. So it was a mixed review of how things are really with the DCA. Um, but it is exciting because this is non-hormonal, which is, um, you know, a plus because not every patient's going to be able to take hormones. Not everyone thinks, um, you know, um, they may have a, um, medical conditions where they cannot take them or they don't like them. So this would, you know, would be exciting if it shown to make a difference. So we, as I say, we recruited 30 participants. They all had chronic pelvic pain. They were willing to try a non-hormonal supplement for 12 weeks. I've lost something there, but never mind. And the blood tests um, at all five visits um, were initially were five visits and that was before COVID. Then what happened was uh, during COVID, we had to keep things uh, ticking along because obviously these patients were trying the supplement and uh, we changed that to three visits during COVID. And then the other two were touching base with the patient and going over uh, a strict criteria to make sure that they were fine. Oh, well, there we go. Five visits to hospital, three um, during the height of COVID. And we took blood tests at all visits, which was fantastic. It also gives us a lot of information. So what we did find was that EPIC was very much acceptable as a non-hormonal treatment option. Um, and encouraging results uh, during this feasibility trial, it's um, really um, exciting. And the next step is actually to secure funding for a larger placebo control trial. And I've said here, we found that EPIC was very much acceptable, but what I mean is uh, we found that DCA was very much acceptable. Um, now, Dr. Lucy Whitaker at um, NHS Lothian has been working tirelessly um, to try and secure funding for a larger placebo control trial. We had a lot of interest from uh, the endometriosis community um, when um, it was shown on BBC News, et cetera, as well. So it goes to show that it's a very much needed trial and we're hoping to, to secure it. So fingers crossed, we'll keep you informed. Um, so this takes us on to the EPIC Plus trial, which is the in-between sort of trial. And um, what happened was during those blood tests that we took from EPIC patients, uh, we found that participants actually metabolize DC at different rates, and this may actually correlate with how well a risk that they responded to treatment. So what we're trying to do is actually recruit 100 patients with confirmed endometriosis. Any type, if you had diagnosed, a diagnostic laparoscopy in the last 10 years, 
we would love to, to take you on as well, whether you're pregnant or not as well. And we would ask you to collect a blood sample and complete some questionnaires, one single visit, which is so, so beneficial uh, to patients who may not have the time um, to, to give us as much as possible. And it could be that we are asking you after your clinical appointment, can you spare half an hour, 45 minutes to go over the questionnaires, give us a blood sample, and hopefully they'll give us a lot more information. And this may help us determine, you know, the dosing regime for the larger EPIC-2 trial, uh, which is the placebo control trial that we're hoping to secure funding for, and it will help us shape the design of that trial. This is some of the really exciting um, news bits that we had. Um, some um, a patient spoke about um, her experience, and it was um, a, a, we we're very very grateful that she gave up all that time to actually talk about her experience with with a trial. At the moment, Epic is only recruiting at NHS Lothian, but we're hoping to change that. Um, we believe that EPIC2 will be uh, recruiting at NHS Lothian and NHS Grampian in Aberdeen. Um, and then it may be that there's even a larger UK-wide trial after that. So I just wanted to tell you just finally some other projects at NHS Lothian. EDUMED, which is um, the sample collection at surgery um, that we're asking ladies, can you please um, um, allow us to take some samples during your surgery. We ask them for questionnaires as well. And that is also together with Endogut. Now, I'm sure that some of the viewers will be thinking, oh, of course, the endometriosis is linked to the gut. Of course it is. Um, or, you know, diet really does flare up if I'm not eating the correct sort of food for myself, or if I eat dairy, it just gives me endo belly, etc. So um, with regards to the sample collection, the Edumid, we're asking ladies to give us a poo sample, a uh, so feces sample, um, and we're putting that together with the symptoms as well. So we, we're asking them to, to kindly give us that and a urine sample. And we're looking at all sorts of the microbiome and the bacteria that we find in women with endometriosis, just to see is that different to women who don't have endometriosis, we don't know. So we've got um, a PhD student, uh, Francesca, who is doing a fantastic job um, and this is a, a project. We also have Endotech and this is the smartwatch that I was talking about earlier on. And we are asking um, ladies of all subtypes with uh, endometriosis, would they be willing to wear a watch for six weeks at a time? three times over. So we would need to capture that throughout three cycles. So we ask them to wear it for six weeks. And then you could, um, if you want to just keep wearing the watch and say, I'll grab another watch, that's another six weeks. And then another six weeks altogether. Um, or it could be that you have a break, you have a holiday, and you think, actually, I'm not going to wear this watch. I'm just, I would prefer not to. We, they complete daily diaries as well. That correlates with... Um, you know, for example, if you've had more fatigue, the watch will collect that. It'll collect your sleep quality. We know endometriosis affects sleep quality, fatigue levels, absolutely everything, because it's not just, you know, um, it's a systemic um, issue and disease. So some FAQs that may have come to light where I want to start participating in the trial, you don't wish to continue, um, that is absolutely fine. You can withdraw at any time, like I said, without your medical care and rights being affected. If you need further medical treatment whilst you're in the trial, that always comes first. Um, so like I say, your clinical care will come first to, to the research. Um, if you feel overwhelmed by the prospect of participating in the trial, like I say, it may be that it's not for you at this given time. In your journey, it could be that in years to come, you think, actually, I'm feeling more positive or I feel like this is the right trial for me. And it could be that participant, participating in research is too overwhelming to, for anyone um, because um, endometriosis is a difficult disease to live with. And um, it's a chronic condition. We don't have a cure. And um, it could be that also you start participating, you think this is just too much. We completely understand life happens um, 
and there's other factors as well. You want to know what treatment you receive? Now, it could be that you're taking part in an open uh, trial. Um, so open label means that, for example, EPIC was we all the patients knew that we're receiving DCA. So that might be the trial for you. If, and then if it is a placebo control trial, that might not be the one for you. And you think, actually, no, you have to be comfortable with the fact that you may not know um, the, the given treatment that you're in if you sign up for a blind trial. And then you want to follow your doctor's recommendation. Of course, we always encourage you to speak to your doctor jointly and discuss what you would like um, out of it. So any uh, pointers to remember is that you and your doctor need to weigh the benefits against any risks and then jointly decide what's best for you. It's important to know that all trials have gone through a rigorous approval process by an ethical review board to ensure that you're not put on any undue risk. Some trials have got a really strict criteria, so please do not be disappointed if we're not able to take you on for that specific trial. There will always be research which will be a good fit for you. Where do you find out where research is available? So posters, your clinician may mention at the, at the clinical appointment, you may be sent a letter of invitation because you've been identified um, by the research team. You could sometimes self-refer. And the other thing is, why not ask at your ne next appointment? Is there any research? You know, at the end of your consultation that I, I could be looking at um, to take part. Please visit our website and expect. It tells you all about um, our current research here on the left-hand side. Also, Endometriosis UK website is invaluable information. They've got a section on research as well. If you go onto clinicaltrials.gov, it's also very useful because you can actually enter the condition of disease, the country where you're in, and filter that, or you can actually see other trials that are happening across the world. These are the contact details for each trial. And I've put myself there for Esprit 2 and EPIC because um, I'm involved in both of them. And if you want to take, inquire more about a diamond or regal, those are the um, email addresses for them. And thank you very much for listening. Um, any questions or comments? Um, and if you, for example, don't want to ask in a public forum, this is my email addresses here. If you have any sort of um, personal information, you're best using the NHS Lothian, um, .scot nhs.uk um, email as well. So thank you very much. I'll just stop talking there and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Priscilla. It was such a great presentation and so much information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my first question is, do you have to live local um, to take part in these trials? Um, it very much uh, depends on the trial that you're looking at. So for example, um, as you could see, um, for EPIC, we're just at the moment recruiting at NHS Lothian, but then for Esprit, we have 37 hospitals. Um, it, if it is a multi-centre, usually what tends to happen is that you will have um, the opportunity probably to explore that because we are always opening more and more sites. So for example, Esprit 2 has got 37 sites, but we're hoping to maybe make that number 45 or 50. Um, there are some trials, for example, if it's an observational trial that you can actually take part wherever you live in the UK, because it could be that we ask you to complete a survey and that is, um, you know, you could just do that online. Um, I think the best thing to, to do is, um, you know, go onto the, the website and have a look and see if you're nearby one of the, the hospitals that are recruiting. But um, you do have to be receiving care in the trust. So, for example, for EPIC, um, I would only be able to recruit patients who are receiving care in NHS Lothian. All right. Thank you. Um, and my next question is, are you planning to do um, any research or clinical study, studies on stage four endometriosis? Do you know of um, any such research that might be happening in southwest England? Southwest, my geography is not fantastic, so please forgive me. Um, well, Diamond is um, 
deep infiltrating stage four endometriosis and so is Rego. And I know that Rego are um, recruiting um, down south as well, I think Southampton sort of way. Um, so, you know, please uh, visit their website to see or look back at this presentation and they'll give you the locations of where they are recruiting. Um, but those are the, the deep end or that we're doing at the moment that we're looking at. Thank you. Um, and next question is, can you take part in any of these studies if you have other autoimmune disorders and are being treated for them? Um, and then it goes on to say, some studies suggest that endometriosis is an autoimmune disorder. What are the thoughts at this time? That's a very interesting question because obviously we always want to find out more about and understand the disease and this is why we do so many sample collections and we um, also, uh, you know, we're asking for urine, we're asking for blood, we're asking for, uh, you know, we're trying to tackle it from all angles. Um, usually it very much depends on the um, criteria that the trial may have. It could be that something so simple like, for example, EPIC, Plus, the blood sample is anyone who's got endometriosis at any time within the last 10 years, whether you're pregnant or not, please give us a blood sample. Excellent. That's straightforward. It doesn't matter if you've got any pre-existing conditions. Um, whereas other ones, other trials, for example, um, Regal may have a really strict um, inclusion criteria because the GnRH analogue arm may be detrimental to you if you've got an autoimmune disorder. It could be that, I'm not sure because I, I can't remember the inclusion criteria as such, but uh, like I say, we would always consider what's best for your clinical um, care more than anything. So we wouldn't want to start you on a medication that was going to harm you in any way. So that's why we do have these strict criteria to protect the patient. Thank you. Um, next question is, if you are successful in securing funding for a larger DCA trial and the results are positive, how long would this take to become a potential treatment for treatment options for patients? That's a great question. How long is a piece of, a piece of string? <laughs> Um, with COVID, things um, slowed down, you know, um, substantially, to be honest with you, with um, research, because all the efforts were put into the research with, with COVID. Um, but um, things are picking up now. And so the study for EPIC started in 2020. That was the original pilot study. Um, and we are now hopefully going to secure this funding. So that's probably going to maybe run for a year or so, so say 2023. If it's positive, I mean, the thing is that the, what's amazing about research is it can help shape the guidelines. It, we work together with uh, NICE guidelines, um, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. Um, if they deem it to be of um, benefit to the patient, you know, I, I believe it's not a very expensive um, supplement either. So and um, it's all also we need to deem it safe and side effects, et cetera, you know, very much depends. But I'm hopeful that by 2020 something, we will um, possibly have DCA as a treatment option. And it could be that we run the trial and it's deemed of no benefit. And that's the, the thing with trial sometimes. Thank you. Sorry, it doesn't Isn't really it? give you an answer of when it may be available or just, uh, it's just tricky. It's, um, it very much depends on the findings. And for um, the EPIC trial, someone's asked if you're, um, can you volunteer for the trial if you're not under um, NHS Lothian? Is, I think you said that at the moment it's just mm -hmm. for... At the moment, unfortunately, and it's um, with regards to like um, the larger trial as well, which um, will be in NHS Lothian. It's just to ensure that, um, you know, we we know all your medical history um, before we sign you up to these st studies as well, so that we can look after you um, and care for you in a, in a clinical way, in the sense of the clinical research. So if there's any issues or anything like that, we've got our doctors that are 
well versed on that study. So at the moment, just any interest loading, I'm afraid. Um, if you do take part in in research, and um, what what's what's the, the the kind of the aftercare if you do receive a placebo? What what's the, what are the next steps for for you in that? Because I imagine that it can be quite emotional as well. It can be, and you know, it's funny because what not funny, uh, more weird. Uh, that's what I'm trying to 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 say, but. Um, sometimes the patients that are most disappointed are those that are on the, on the active drug mm. and it's not worked for them because if you have been receiving placebo and you know that you've, you've maybe taken it for 12 weeks and it hasn't worked for you, then the next step could be starting you on the actual drug to see if okay. that helps. Um, so sadly, those, sometimes those are the most disappointing results, really. Mm. Okay, thank you. And um, this is just my my last question because we don't have any other questions. Um, yeah. So after this one, I'll, I'll close it. But so, how long? Um, what's what's the longest that you've had to monitor someone? Or um, and does monitoring does it ever go beyond? Um, like when you've um, when you've released the drug, um, do you carry on monitoring as well? It depends on the drug. So if it's a drug that is used in um, clinical care already and um, it's been given at a dose which is usually used in clinical care as well, depend, you know, depending on that, then we would monitor for as long as it, the protocol uh, would dictate. So what we work um, through is for any trial we have a protocol that tells you exactly how to run the trial and how long for etc so this is all um been looked at by like I was saying you know the ethics committee etc and say that's not too much of a burden etc now if you're on a drug and you could be on a drug for four months for example then we would monitor you as you taper off um and after that that would probably be the end of it um and it could be that we're asking you to complete questionnaires at 12 months after that to see if that four months has had any impact on you. So um, it would very much depend if you had really bad side effects, then we would monitor you until those side effects um, resolved completely. So we wouldn't just leave you because the protocol dictated 12 weeks and it's been past those 12 weeks. We would obviously look after you.